welcome back to the channel. Did border closure, school closure, lockdowns, shelter in place actually slow the spread of coronavirus? Well, we've got the definitive answer now. Just out in Science Advances is a new article that's gonna give us what I think is the definitive. By that I mean it's the best we're ever gonna get. The best we're ever gonna get answer about whether or not the restrictions placed globally in 2020 and beyond actually change the dynamics of the coronavirus infection. The title of the paper is, in, is Epidemic Outcomes Following Government Responses to COVID-19 Insights from Nearly 100,000 Models. It's by Iran Ben David and Trog Patel. It's a brilliant paper. It's a really brilliant paper. And I'm going to walk you through the paper and what it means and why I think it's going to be the best answer we're ever going to get. But first, you, may, you might remember, you may remember back in March of 2020, in a two-week period of frenzy, all of the governments around the world panicked around the coronavirus and took extreme measures in response. We had had horrific scenes coming out of a northern Italian city called Bergamo, of where there was really healthcare collapse from the coronavirus. Now, people forget that Bergamo has a median age, I think, in the 80s, and it was a very elderly city, but that was a very catastrophic scene that was planted in people's memory. A few weeks later, we'd have New York City, again, the nursing homes, which would have some degree of healthcare collapse because so many people got coronavirus, particularly older people, all at once. We also had a report out from Imperial College London, which postulated a million deaths if the U.S. were to take no action in the first wave of the pandemic, something that never came to fruition. And then the final thing was that policymakers in the Western world looked over in China, where the epidemic began, and they took lessons from a totalitarian authoritarian government in terms of what you were capable to do to the population. So in response to that, we did things that we have never done in human history, which is have global travel bans and suppress people from congregating in outdoor spaces, and we filled skate parks with sand, et cetera, et cetera. And we took all these precautions. And since then, there's been a great deal of interest in knowing whether or not they worked. There was one way you would have known for sure whether or not they worked. And this is the technique that policymakers should employ when they're debuting things they're uncertain about. And that is you have to introduce some random variation in the system. You have to either have staggered implementation, meaning some municipalities and some schools and some hospitals do something ahead of other municipalities, other schools, other hospitals. You either have to have that or random implementation. Some hospitals do it, some hospitals don't do it. But when you just do things willy-nilly, when you just do things in sort of a chaotic and uncontrolled way, you end up with data that might not be very useful. And that's what these authors are tackling. We never did any of those other studies. We didn't do staggered implementation. We didn't do randomization. We didn't do it for any question, for lockdowns, for border closure, for school reopening. Those are the big questions, but not even for the smaller ones, for three feet versus six feet, for cohorting, for different test strategies, for masking cloth versus surgical. The United States ran zero randomized studies on these non-pharmacologic questions. Enter the recent paper. So Ben David and Chirag Patel look at the literature, and they note that there's some papers that conclude that lockdowns work, they slow the spread of COVID-19, they save lives. There's some papers that conclude lockdowns don't work. They actually have no effect at all, or some might even say that they accelerate the spread of coronavirus. And there's some papers that say they had no effect in the middle. And they say the problem with these papers is everybody is taking a data set of different countries or locations, the measures that they implemented and when, and how much coronavirus cases, hospitalizations, and deaths they got on the back end. And they're adjusting for other factors like population density and size and things of this nature, adjusting for other variables that might have something to do with coronavirus spread that are separate from the policy. And that's how everyone does it, these large observational sort of studies. And what they're saying is instead of doing one study and publishing it in the Lancet or one study that shows that it really saved lives and publishing that in the British Medical Journal, because they're the ones who want to hear that, what if we were to run 100,000 studies on the topic? What if we were to run all of the possible, you know, really sort of sensible studies you could run on the topic, 100,000 different models asking if these pandemic restrictions helped, hurt, or had no effect. And that's what they do. They get this big data set, and they basically run 100,000 models. And basically, the reason I call their paper the best we're ever going to get and definitive is they're really asking what happens if 10,000 different research teams run 10 different models over the next year and we pool all those papers together, will we get consensus or will we have disagreement? One more interesting thing. To validate that this method actually gets at the truth, they wanted to take something that we have a strong belief actually worked 
and ask if this method would show that it actually worked. And this is called a falsification test. About 12 years ago in JAMA, Anupam Jena from Harvard and myself, we wrote an article about falsification tests. We said we ought to do more of this in observational research. And these authors have done it. They followed our, our guidance, and I'm glad they did. Here's what they did. They took something that we think really did work, which was measles vaccination policies a few decades ago. There was a certain rate of measles. We implemented all these policies to slow the spread of measles. Back then, we had vaccines that, I don't know, prevented you from getting the virus once you got the vaccine. That was, that was an old time. That was the, old, the good old days. And well, of course, the coronavirus is the type of virus that it would be unlikely that a vaccine would halt transmission. Anyway, that's another story. I've talked about that on the channel before. They picked measles vaccination policies. And then they asked, did different places that implemented these policies at different times have a reduction in measles commensurate with proof that the policy actually worked? And in fact, they found in every analytic plan statistically significant that the policies actually slowed the spread of measles. So that proves this method, if you take something that you really have confidence actually works, can show that it actually works. Like it is capable of validating something. Let's turn to COVID-19. So we know this method of trying all these sorts of plausible analytic plans, it sort of simulates the research community. And if something really works, perhaps even all or the majority of the analytic plans will show that it works. What happens when you put it on the COVID-19 questions? And the answer is extremely sobering. They found a small handful, this is 100,000 different models, 100,000 different ways to, to query if the restriction actually slowed the spread of COVID-19. A tiny handful showed that it did slow the spread of COVID-19. A tiny handful showed that it accelerated the spread of COVID-19. And the vast majority of analytic plans, the vast, vast majority of analytic plans showed that it had no significant effect on COVID-19 spread. Absolutely null. And they did this many different ways. They did this for policies recommended in 2020 versus those recommended beyond. And every way you looked at the data, you find the same picture. Under a few set of select assumptions, you can show that it quote unquote works and you can publish your BMJ paper, for instance, if you cherry pick your covariates. And under a few set of assumptions, you can show for sure it didn't work or spread the virus. But most of the time you find null effects, that it just didn't do much. The effect sizes are trivial. It probably, probably didn't do much. And that's what they find. And this tells us so many things. One, it tells us that if you're keeping up with the literature and you're waiting for that economist from Harvard to prove if the policies helped or hurt, you're going to be waiting a long time because they're going to prove it helps and next week they're going to prove it hurts. They're going to show this great multiverse of variability. That's one thing. We're never going to get a definitive study. This is the definitive study because these authors are simulating what's going to happen in the next 15 and 20 and 100 years when they keep running studies. Some will say it works, some will say it spread, and most will say it didn't do anything. The next point, it didn't do anything is probably the right answer. It's probably the right answer because these totalitarian regimens change things on the margin. The vast majority of human behavior was voluntary human behavior. These restrictions came at great social cost and created a strong public backlash. They had no credible evidence when they launched them. They launched them in the way that was incapable of generating credible evidence. That's what this paper shows. I'll talk more about that. And they mostly show it didn't work. And the thing is, when you study medicine and public health a long time, you find that in the grand scheme, in the grand human experience, most of the things we do that we think help and most of the things we do that we think hurt mostly don't do, don't do anything. Most of the things we do don't do anything. A few things really do work. A few things don't. The next point. <clears throat> Some of these policies are a complete fiasco. Let's say school closure. School closure has a massive learning loss to these kids. Keeping it closed for 18 months like these deranged cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco, that is an extremely harmful intervention to children. Their educational levels have plummeted. They've lost grade levels. We know that educational attainment predicts longevity, predicts uh, you know, if you're gonna be a teen parent, if you're gonna die by gun violence, if you're gonna live a long and prosperous life. Education is the pathway to riches and longevity and that was taken away from these kids and it had minimal to no impact on coronavirus spread. And this paper also validates that idea. So we harmed kids as we did over and over in the pandemic with no credible evidence. And we didn't gain much from it. Moreover, the policymakers, you know, this is the thing that wasn't covered enough is that 
What did Fauci get wrong? I made a video about that recently. But the thing Fauci and Tedros and all these pontificating public health blowhards got wrong was they implemented huge sweeping policies that have never been implemented. Even I was okay with that, but they did it in a way that they would never be able to know if they made the right choice or the wrong choice. All you had to do was staggered implementation. All you had to do was listen to Atla Fretheim about his school reopening proposal and how to do that in the context of a cluster randomized trial. All you had to do was have your policy, but collect data along the way and refine your policy as things went on. Very likely, masking kids under five does nothing. Cloth masking didn't do anything. They never tested these policies rigorously, and they never changed course. And that is not what a scientist does. That's why they're not scientists, in my opinion. They're not true scientists. They're people who studied science, who enjoy seeing themselves on TV. They enjoy making proclamations. But a real scientist runs experiments in real time to course correct, to know if they got it right or wrong. In my mind, Fauci has the least excuse because he is the head of a $5 billion research fund used to fund infectious disease science. He could have snapped his fingers and gotten a randomized control trial of three feet versus six feet. He's testifying in front of the house, says, I don't have anything to do with six feet. He could have, let's study six feet versus three feet, run it in a month in a bunch of schools and show that three feet is non-inferior. There's no increased, there's no uh, unnecessary increased or harmful increased risk of transmission. Move to three feet, then do three versus one, then do you know not, nothing versus three, then do different cohorting. You could run these studies in real time. He had the budget, he has the power, he's got the connections. He never did any of that. He just went on TV and said to do something while not studying it. He was on TV so much, he didn't have time to actually think about research proposals. He was on TV 20 times a day. So that to me is the failure. That's what's unjustified. Back to this paper. This is gonna be the definitive paper on lockdowns. There's never gonna be a paper better than this paper. I doubt that there could be because they're really running 10,000, not 10,000, 100,000 different papers. And totality of the evidence shows it didn't do anything. Some says it's beneficial and some says it's harmful. Harmful, let's not forget it's harmful. It's not even just saying no benefits, it's just saying it's spread to coronavirus. We're not gonna get the perfect answer here, but it is almost overwhelmingly the case that it didn't work that well. When you talk about the US entering into a pact with global nations to uh, march lockstep into future pandemics based on their policy, I think that's a bad idea. I think the real failure of the pandemic was an evidence generation failure, that people wanted to take firm stances and say we knew things that we had absolutely no idea of. We don't know school closure helped people. It almost certainly harmed them a great deal. Vaccine mandates almost certainly harmed people a great deal. No evidence that they helped. Border closure, total fiasco. Every variant spread anyway. This paper is not validating what we did. We spent collectively $20 trillion on pandemic. We had millions of people die. and. To leave the pandemic with no knowledge about what actually works, what doesn't under what circumstances is abject failure. The coronavirus pandemic did not happen during the Middle Ages, but we're no better than the people who survived the Black Death. They learn nothing, we learn nothing. That to me is really unacceptable. I really wonder how people, you know, I see so many people defending Fauci and other policymakers saying they did the best with what they had at the time. No, they didn't, actually. They could have run studies. I don't understand. How do you defend zero studies? And that's the other thing. Some people say, well, you can't do a study of masking, no masking. I was like, I appreciate that you're wrong about it. I appreciate you're wrong. But let's say you're wrong. Let's just indulge you in being wrong. You don't think you could have done a study of N95 or surgical? Oh, well, I guess you could have done that. So, oh, so there is a study that every single person thinks could have been done. Or Let's say, oh, surgical, we know that doesn't work. Okay, then N95 versus KN94, that thing with the loop ears. You don't think you could do that study? Oh, everybody has a study that they think is possible. They're just different points on the equipoise spectrum. They ran zero studies. I don't know how anyone can justify zero studies. This paper is a very clever paper. Science advances. This is a paper that shows that the analytic flexibility in the existing data set is so much that you will never get a conclusive answer on any policy with $20 trillion and 7 million dead people. You have no idea if you helped or hurt. And that is the greatest and most stinging indictment on global policymakers ever. And we can talk a lot about people who said whatever on Twitter and 
who got things right or who got things wrong. The failure are the people who had the ear of politicians who actually set pandemic policy. Number one is Fauci. Number two is Tedros. Number three, I mean, these are the global scientists that people turned to in this crisis. They were on TV all the time. Maybe number three is Ashish Jha. You know, they're on TV all the time, and they never used that influence or power to run even one credible study on this topic. How is that justified? I think that's what I find so shocking. So I have a piece out in Sensible Medicine. It's called Anthony Fauci Failed During the Coronavirus Response, a new paper in Science Advances led by Ben David, and Patel shows how and why. And I want one more comment at the end. That name Ben David sounds familiar to me. Why does that sound familiar? Oh! He's an author of the Santa Clara seroprevalence study. This is a study that tried to estimate how many people had already had and recovered from COVID-19 in first quarter of 2020 in Santa Clara County, just down the road here. And he's somebody who used to go on TV early in the pandemic, exercising caution, saying lockdown might do more harm than good, saying we don't really know the infection fatality rate of the virus. He ran his own study. People criticize the Santa Clara County study, and I agree with some of the criticism, particularly the stuff around confidence intervals, but here's what they don't say. Why the hell did we have Stanford professors have to do their own study on seroprevalence? Why didn't the CDC, with their 40,000 employees and their billion-dollar budget, run a serial seroprevalence study from many sampled hotspots around the country over and over and keep that running statistic on the website? Why are we relying on these people that's a CDC failure even to rely on Ben David. Okay, next point. Ben David famously, and there's a column written by Jay Bhattacharya on this topic, was asked to keep his mouth shut by Bob Harrington, who was then the chair of medicine, now the dean of Cornell. He was asked not to comment on these policies because they were so controversial. We forget, but in 2020, you couldn't be an academic and say school closure is a bad idea. You might have risked being fired or reprimanded at your university or had your promotion and tenure sabotaged. So Ben David, sometime in the course of 2020, he was an associate professor back then, he went quiet, scared into silence, in my opinion. That is the real, most inappropriate part about the pandemic. While they were implementing policy that they're not testing and going on TV and saying you gotta do it, while all that's going on, there's a back campaign to prevent anyone who disagrees from ever voicing that opinion, either by pulling them in the office, the classic academic way, by threatening their funding. Fauci's implicitly threatens their funding because if you disagree with the man in charge of the $5 billion portfolio funding, you might not get funding in the future. The campaign by Collins and Fauci to discredit the Great Barrington Declaration authors as fringe epidemiologists. This is all going on in the backdrop. So what you have is a total fiasco, a total evidence fiasco where people making proclamations don't run studies and sabotage any critics who disagree with them. What an interesting, what an interesting thing. Terrible, really. But, but not many people see it my way. I wonder why they don't see it yet. I don't think, I, I think most academics don't see it my way because they didn't actually keep up with all these things. Very, they didn't watch it very closely. All right, those are my thoughts. And that's why I think with time, and if they were to actually have more discussions about this topic, which they still don't want to do, but if they were to, they would eventually concede that these points are very damning. Epidemic outcomes following government response to COVID-19, 100,000 models. Their conclusion is we don't know anything. They write, let me read you the quote, the concentration of estimates around a zero effect weakly suggests the government response did little to nothing to change the burden of COVID-19. I think that's a mistake. It should say, it suggests, not weakly suggests, there's no weak about it. It suggests they did little to nothing. Some analyses even suggest harm and very few suggest benefit. It's about the same harm and benefit. That's a damning indictment of what we did. Ch changing people's lives, arresting people who weren't wearing a mask, ticketing people for being outdoors, all these horrific abuses of the police state in the mistaken name of public health, pushed by people who weren't studying these issues at all. And now we're left with a data set so full of shit, you'll never be able to find the signal. Again, we're not, we're not that many generations away from the ignorant people who lived through the Black Death, and we're just as ignorant in many ways. We're just as ignorant. Technological progress masks just how stupid the average scientist is and how, how little we've come forward. And I think that to me is the most sobering sort of sociologic takeaway about science in, in this time. All right, those are some thoughts. It's a great paper. It's a really brilliant paper. Um, a lot of credit to Ben David, and uh, who unfortunately was, I think, pushed into silence. Uh, and uh, 
Chirag Patel for this sort of really nice analysis. Next time somebody says, there's a paper that shows lockdown helps, it's from The Lancet, you can tell them, yeah, there's 100,000 other anal analytic plans and 96,000 of them show no effect and maybe a few show their effect and a few show harm. So you can cherry pick all day, but this is gonna be the definitive study that shows probably null effects like most things in biomedicine and public health have a null effect. Most of the things we tried in human history that we thought were promising didn't do that much. Probably that's the case here. But more than that, the uncertainty bounds are so great. And that is an indictment of the people who set the policy in a way that they would never be able to face any accountability for what they said because no data could ever be provided that what they said was right or wrong. And that to me is anti-science, the most deepest form of anti-science, to keep talking and not studying the things you're saying. All right, if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. I'll be back with more. Until next time.